Welcome to Computing at Home with Digital Schoolhouse. My name is Estelle, otherwise known as ComSciGeek. I'm a computing teacher and I also develop resources for the programme. We specialise in delivering computing workshops that are accessible, educational and fun. You are watching part one of our Big Data workshop and this workshop is unplugged, meaning you don't need any technology to take part. Don't forget, all of the part ones of our workshops are unplugged, meaning you don't need any tech to take part just a device to watch the video and you can watch any of our previously streamed workshops on our YouTube channel. Just search YouTube for Digital Schoolhouse. To all learners watching, remember you can pause the video at any time to take notes, collect your thoughts or take part in the workshop alongside me. The Digital Schoolhouse team are ready and waiting in the chat should you have any questions and I'll also be taking five minutes at the end to answer your questions. So hang around at the end of the workshop and please drop some, work to, uh, some questions into the chat for me. Parents and guardians you might want to watch the next bit as it explains how to access our resources but after that feel free to join in or sit nearby to supervise if you want to. Let's get started. Okay, so first of all, I'm just going to talk you through the resources that you're going to need for this uh, particular workshop. So you're going to need a notepad, um, a pencil, you might want to also have a rubber in case you make mistakes, like I do, and want to rub them out. And also you're going to need a copy of either some Guess Who cards, or if you don't have Guess Who at home, I also managed to find a, um, a copy of these Guess Who cards for free on a website. So let me show you where to find those now. Okay, so if you head onto the internet, and let me um, show you where to access these resources from. So, duh, 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 duh. My, there it is, sorry about that. Right, so um, if you head on to the Digital Schoolhouse website, as usual, you can go to resources, then live workshops. You'll find the big data resources are at the top here where it says big data. So if you're interested in running this um, as a, a, a scheme of work at your school or you want to suggest it as a scheme of work for your school, that's where they'll find all the resources and all the worksheets and files that you can use for this particular worksheet. So they're all inside that folder, which will take you to a Google Drive folder. Um, alongside that, so the Guess Who cards, if you don't have your own copy of Guess Who, what you can do is if I go back to the res main resources link for live workshops, if you go to where you um, registered for this workshop, if you did register, um, you'll find there is also a file in here which will give you a free copy of some Guess Who cards that you can use for this workshop. Um, sorry, I just wait for it to load, then I can show you where to click. Um, so if you don't have a copy of Guess Who, you can download your free Guess Who cards online clicking that link there and that will take you to um, a website which is um, it's another education um, website which specialises in language resources. So when that loads you'll see that will take you to um, a copy of Guess Who that's been created by Language Nut which you can download and print off should you want to take part with the with me if you don't have a copy of Guess Who at home. So that's where, uh, what you could use if you don't have access to Guess Who, so you don't have a copy of these cards. Okay, so let's um, properly start our workshop. Okie dokie. So this is Big Data and you're watching part one. And as I said, this is an unplugged workshop, meaning you don't need any technology to take part. Um, and as I said earlier, all part ones of our workshops are unplugged. So if you enjoy this, please do watch them back on our YouTube channel. So in this workshop, you're going to learn about collecting data using a survey. You're going to create a survey using open and closed questions. You're going to use some simple um, filtering techniques. You're going to analyse your survey data and you're going to learn how to use a sorting algorithm. And finally, you're going to do a little bit of um, ethical work on this as well. And we're going to look at when an app is asking to access your data and what you should do if that happens. So that is what we're going to be looking at today. As usual, if there's any new words in there, don't worry, we'll explain what they mean as we go along. So first little computing definition for you is the word data. Data is information in a raw or un unorganised form, such as alphabets, numbers or symbols, and that refers to or represents conditions, ideas or objects. So data is just like numbers or words, but it has no meaning. So you look at it, you don't understand what it is. You might be able to guess, but it, you don't actually know what the meaning is. So 
co uh, collecting data. Companies like to know what you think of their products and services. To do this, they need to collect data from people using these products and services and then use computer programs to analyse the data to find out what people want. We call this big data. So it used to be really common for people to stop you in the town centre and ask you questions on behalf of different companies. But that became not particularly easy to do. So we'll talk a bit more about that as we go on. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to create our own survey to start with and we're going to do a household survey. So we're going to design our own survey. What should we survey your household about? So you might have your own ideas for this and if you want to come up with something yourself, that's fine. But what we're going to do is we're going to survey to find out what the people in your house would like to have at a party. OK, so it might be something that you're planning in the future when we get fully out of lockdown. You want to have a big party with your friends. Um, let's plan what that might look like by survey, surveying the people in your house. So we need to think about what kind of questions we want to ask on our survey. So these are the kind of things that I might want to ask in my survey. Um, what kind of entertainment people want, what kind of drinks, music, what colour scheme we might, might use, what desserts we're going to have, what activities we're going to do, what games, and all oh, very important to me definitely, what food we might want to eat. So there are two types of questions when you're creating your survey. Uh, you need to think about this quite carefully. They are open questions and closed questions. Now you might have come across this a little bit in English before. So um, we talk about this quite a lot and we, whenever we want to use questions we need to think about whether they need to be open or closed. So I'll give you an example of an open question. What would you like at your party is an open question because you can put whatever you like as a response. It could be like I've written, I'd like to have a pony ride and a live band. Um, it's open, you can write whatever you like as your response. But a closed question is where you give the person right, um, completing your questionnaire or your survey the answers and you let them choose between a certain number of answers. And it's closed because they can't put anything, they can't put just anything they like, they have to choose from your uh, responses. So in this example I put, how many sandwiches would you eat? And they can choose between five, six, seven, eight or nine. Obviously they must be very hungry and needing to eat lots of sandwiches at the party. So we're going to do not a class party survey, but a home party survey. What might you use to create your survey? So if you do have access to a computer today, you might want to use something like a desktop publishing software. Um, so I created mine in um, Microsoft Publisher, for example. Uh, you might want to use a word processor like Word um, or presentation software. You might want to use web authoring software and actually put it on the internet and ask people so you can actually send it out to your friends who might be coming to the party from outside of your household. You could even use a spreadsheet for designing your survey. But because we're going to be working um, without having to use a computer other than watching the video, of course, we're going to be using paper, pencils, and you could use coloured pencils as well if you want to make it look bright and interesting and inviting. So I've got down here already set up my pen my pencil and my pad that I'm going to be using for designing my survey on. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be creating a survey with those questions on. So the first thing you need to do is make a title for your survey. So to do this, I'm going to grab my pencil and I'm going to just write at the top party survey because that's what I'm going to be creating. And you can think about how you want to do your writing or you could do as a, a rough copy to start with and then add more detail in later on. There we go, so party survey. Um, and then I have actually got my coloured pencils here so I can add some colour to that as well. So do feel free to add some colour to your work because it always makes it much more interesting to look at if you've got a bit of colour in there. So I'm going to go for every other letter being in green. Oops, didn't quite go every other letter in the second word there. Some of the things when I'm rushing sometimes I don't think fully and plan what I'm doing. So do take your time, don't make silly mistakes like me. Okay, so there you go, there is my party survey title. And my first question is going to be um, the person's name, because I need to know who's answering the survey. So I'm going to put that in first. What kind of question is this? Is this open or closed? 
it's an open question they can put whatever they like in the answer box I'm going to put a box in there for them to write their answer in you might want to use a ruler as well to make it look really neat okay so the next question I'm going to have is how long the party should last There we go, and I'm going to give them some different options to tick. So it's going to be in hours. So we've got one hour with a box to tick, two hours, box to tick, three hours, and a box to tick. Okay, and then you can obviously they can tick to say which one they think is the right answer. At this point, do not fill in the boxes because this is our blank copy. Okay. So you don't want to be filling it in because you need to give it to someone else to do that job. So just remember that, um, that this is for you, for someone else to fill in. So don't, don't be tempted to put your name or anything in the boxes as we're going through. The next thing I'm going to have is a choice of different food items. What food do you want? Okay, and I'm going to just do the yes or no for this. So I'm going to say I'm going to have pizza. I like a bit of a pizza party. And I'm going to have yes or no. And I'm going to give a little boxes for them to tick. I'm going to have uh, sandwiches. And then again, boxes to tick. I'm going to have cake. I've got to have cake at a party, in my humble opinion. And I'm going to do the same thing over this side as well. I'm also going to have, um, let's have sausages. And again, I'm going to have an option of a yes or a no tick box. There we go. And what else could we have? I've got crisps, of course. And I've got to think of one more thing, which is going to be sweets. Now, you can add more items to your survey. It's completely up to you because this is your design for your party. Um, the next thing I'm going to ask them is if they want to have a party theme. Now, I'm quite a fan of a party theme because I think it's quite nice because then you can like everything can be decorated and laid out in a particular way so I'm gonna have a party, party theme idea and again this is going to be a open question where the person can put whatever answer they'd like in the box I'm gonna give a bit of space for the person to write the answer and this time I'm actually gonna use my ruler to make it look a little bit better because I think actually if I'd use a ruler at the very beginning it would have looked better wouldn't it um, so Maybe that's a good idea as well for you. Do use a ruler. It makes it look that much neater. And there we go. Yeah, much better. Right, so party theme idea. And my last question is going to be whether or not they want music at the party. So should there be music at the party? And this is going to be a yes or no again. So I'm going to put yes with a little box next to for ticking, or no, and a box next to for that. Okay, so there is my party survey. So if I was spending a bit more time on this, I'd probably go through and add a little bit of detail to the design so it would all look really nice and inviting, and hopefully people would be more likely to want to fill it in. But I don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm not gonna spend too long doing, doing that. But you can spend some time filling in your, um, designing your survey and spending some time actually making it look really nice and inviting to use. Once you've finished that survey and you've and you've finished um, adding some colour to it so it looks really nice, the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to design yourself three identical copies. So you're going to take the copy that you've, des you've de designed on paper. If you're lucky enough to have access to a photocopier at home, then you could do photocopies of it or you just need to do identical copies onto um, two more sheets of paper. So take your survey and design or copy and create yourself three identical copies of the survey. Okay, we're gonna come back to that um, because we will, won't need it for a minute, but what you will need to do a bit later on is get three different people in your house to fill it in, okay? So you might want to do that now, hand it over to, to those people in your household to fill it in, or if you want to come back to it later, then that's also fine. And I'll, I'll tell you when you need to get them to fill it in if you don't ha haven't actually done it at this stage. If you want to pause at this moment and finish off your survey and doing the finish off the copies of it and getting people to fill it in, that's fine. So it's a good point to, to do that pause now if you need to. Okie dokie. 
Okay, so keep hold of those surveys once you've collected them back in because you're going to need them later. And as I said, if you haven't managed to get someone to fill it in right now, I'll tell you at what, which point you need to have it filled in by. Okay, so there's two problems with surveying people in the street. So I talked to you earlier about how it used to be really common for people just to stop you in the street and get you to fill in a survey um, to ask you questions about a particular brand or even sometimes chocolate. So they even get you to do taste uh, tests as well and ask you what you thought about this new chocolate bar, which was really nice. But there are two problems with that. First, you have to stumble across the right people to ask your questions to. And second, you, uh, people don't really like being stopped in the street to answer questions. So actually, there's, that, that's probably the biggest problem. People don't like being stopped and asked questions. And actually, um, if you aren't stopping the people that are the right people to ask the questions to, then it's almost pointless in asking them in the first place. So uh, those are two of the problems with surveying people just in the street. It's also very expensive as you need lots of people out asking the questions in order to get a big enough data set to analyse and actually to find out information from. So analyse just means that you collect all the information together and you look for trends. So things that lots of people are saying where they're saying the same thing. Um, and it's really expensive to do that because you'd need lots of people out asking the questions. So can you think of a better way of collecting data? Have you got any ideas? Have a little think. Any ideas? Okay, maybe you've come up with the same idea as what I'm going to talk to you about next, because one of the things um, you can do is actually collect data without having to ask any questions. Now, have you got any ideas about that? How could you find a way of collecting data without having to ask any questions at all? Now, people like to share information about what they like and they don't like on social media. Is there a way of collecting this data? Good question isn't it is there a way of collecting this data because if there was that would be a way of collecting information without having to ask any questions so information just use that word then didn't I instead of the word data information is data that has meaning in some context for its receiver so for example Peter is 10 might give you the impression that Peter is age 10 for example okay so information is data that has meaning so we talked about data to start with and we said that data is information that doesn't have any meaning to you so it just it is numbers and you think i don't know what that means it doesn't have any meaning to me like seven nine twenty seven what does it mean are they house numbers are they ages it has no meaning but information is data that has meaning so if i say the same numbers again five seven twenty seven but then tell you that the house numbers then suddenly they have meaning so they become information so that's really important when we're talking about data and information data has no meaning but information does so analytics companies collect the information that people share publicly on social media sites um, and they collect all that information together and they use it in a way that is um, looking for information, looking for trends in the data. And we call that huge, big data set of data. We call that big data. And it's the name given to data that's collected by people uh, who work for analytics companies. So one of the places that they collect these kind of data from is social media sites. It's not just social media sites, but one of the places. And that's where we're going to be focusing what we're doing today on. So one way that big data is used is um, in analytics companies that look for trends quickly. So people want to know things really quickly nowadays. They don't want to wait for, for ages to see what, whether people like something or they don't like something. They want to know straight away. And one of the ways that, that companies can do that is by looking at the um, big data that people are sharing on social media. So computers are really good at looking for trends in data as they're able to analyse millions of data points really, really quickly. So how do they do this? So they're going to now have a look at big data and how it, you can use big data to analyse data. So the first thing we do is we're going to have a look at the idea of filtering. So if we could filter the data, then we'd be able to see the, stre the trends straight away. So what we're going to do for this is I have set up, hopefully it's working, a lovely little board of um, a game of, Gus of Guess Who. Okay, so here's my Guess Who game here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example of filtering some data. So if we filter the data, and if you imagine this is a group of people who have been tweeting about a particular company, um, let's make up a, a company. So let's pretend this is a company called Amoeba Games, and they have designed a new game, and they want to know what people think of their game. So what they can start to do is look for trends in the data. So they might start to notice 
certain information. So for example, let's pretend that there are certain people in our data who work in a particular field. So let's say that all the people who are teachers really seem to like this game. So we're going to get rid of the people who aren't teachers. Laura's not a teacher. Neither is Farah or Mark, Mike, sorry, or Lily or Ben. But all these other people are teachers. So we're starting to see a trend in the data that that teachers are saying they really like this new game from Amoeba Games. Then we might notice other things about the people. So we might start to notice that there's also lots of people in the data set who also have an interest in going to the cinema. And we then get rid of a couple of people who don't like going to the cinema. So let's get rid of David. He doesn't like going to the cinema. And neither does Amy. She doesn't like going to the cinema. But all these other people do like going to the cinema. So this gives Amoeba Games an idea that actually, if they started to advertise their new latest game at cinema, then people that who are likely to enjoy their game and want to go and buy it might well be that part of the audience, so in the audience at the cinema. So that's the kind of things that are really good that um, computers can do with big data because they're able to filter the data to find out useful information that will help to tell them trends that means that they'll be able to sell more of their product. So that's why it's really, really important to big business. Okay, so let's hop back into the presentation and have a look at um, what we're going to do next. So do you remember I said to you that there was a moment when you need to come back and get your survey and start to use the answer to your survey. So we've reached that point. So if you haven't got people to fill in your survey, this is what, where you need to do that. So do pause us the um, stream now, get um, three people to fill in your survey, or you can just ask them the questions and note down their responses, because we're going to do a quick analyse of what data we've found out. So the first thing that you're going to need to do is as I said, make sure you've got your survey. You need to make sure you've got three people to fill it in. So I'm going to fill in my survey because I think that my information is just as important as the rest of the people who live in my house. So I'm going to fill in mine. So I'm going to say Estelle, um, I think two hours for my party. I'd like pizza uh, and cake. I'm not too fussed about having sandwiches. Um, I like crisps, not sausages, and I definitely want sweets. My party theme idea is going to be um let's see what could i have as my party theme um it's going to be a friends thing because i quite like friends the tv show um so i quite like the idea that i might have a friends themed party and then should there be music at the party most definitely yes so i've answered all the, the questions so what's once you've done that and you've got your three surveys filled in what you're going to need to do next is take those responses and start to do a little bit of tallying on what they've said. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the first question, which is obviously the name, and I don't need to put too much detail down for that. So I can put the people's names down. So I filled in one, Ed filled in one, and Max filled in one. So the next question I've got is how long should the party be? And now I've got the same response on all three of my surveys. So I'm going to do, um, so I've got one hour, two hours or three hours. And I'm just going to use like a tally to just show what the answer was for that particular question. So what we're doing is we're just using a bit of scrap paper and we're identifying what um, the responses were and how many people responded to each question in what way. So just to show you what we're doing, I'll just very quickly jump back to the right section and show you that now. Okay, so what we're doing is we're just counting how many of each answer we got, okay? So I'm just gonna use a tally to do that. So I'm gonna say that all three people who filled in my survey wanted it to be two hours long. So let me just jump over and show you what I mean by that. There you go. So um, two hours, all three people said they wanted it to be uh, two hours long. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is the next question, so the food. So I'm just going to put food. And then on this one, I've got some slightly different responses. So I've got pizza, remember? I've got sandwiches. I've got cake. Sausages. Crisps. And sweets. So I had, for my response, I've got pizza, cake, um crisps and sweets but Ed said that he wanted pizza sausages and cake 
And Max, well, he doesn't really mind. He'll have all of it, he says. So in that case, I put one down for everything from him. So that starts to tell me which bits of food are likely to be a real big hit at my party. And in the party theme ideas, Now I put my idea as friends and I can see, whoops, let's start again. <laughs> and I can see that on my other ones, on my other surveys from Ed and Max, um, they weren't too fussed. They haven't actually suggested any party theme ideas. So we're going to stick with the friends theme, I think, because they've not given me any other suggestions. Okay, the next one was about whether or not we want music. And it was yes or no, and that was a very much resounding yes. They all want music at the party. So there you go. We've analysed our party surveys and we've identified trends from the three surveys that we took. But you can see, with just three people, it doesn't tell us a huge amount of detail. But if you imagine this with lots of people filling in my survey, we'd have a clear idea of what kind of things that we want to have the part at the party based on the people who are going to be attending. So that's where it's really useful to be able to analyse data like this. So if you need to pause the stream just to finish that off that analysis yourself, then do. Or if you're ready to move on, we can start to look at the next section now. OK, so we've already discussed this a little bit. So what were your findings? What did you notice about the data? What did you find out about the kind of um, trends that people who live in your household would like in a party? This will help you to identify the kinds of things that people are going to want and need at your party. So you end up delivering a party that everyone really, really enjoys. So computers are really good at analysing data very quickly using algorithms. Now, we've talked about algorithms quite a lot in our previous workshops. So if that's a new word for you and you've not seen our previous ones, just to remind you, the word algorithms means um, an algorithm is a set of instructions that could be followed in sequence. That means in order, in order to do some particular activity. So it could be drawing a square. It could be doing a dance routine. If you did just dance with us, um, it could be basically anything as long as it is to um, some sort of activity and you're following the steps in order to for something to happen that's an algorithm so we're going to learn about one particular algorithm a bit later we're going to learn about the max function which finds the highest number in a set of values so we're going to be having a look at how we can use that to find out information so just to recap that computing definition an algorithm is a set of instructions to be followed in sequence to achieve a result and in this case we're going to be finding the highest number in a set of data. So what does the algorithm for max look like? So there's two parts to it. First of all we have to sort the data into descending order. That means that it starts with the biggest number and then goes down to the smallest and then we have to identify the first item. Okay so hopefully that sounds quite simple for you. So sort the data into descending order and identify the first item. So we're going to try it ourselves and I'm going to show you how to do something called a bubble sort. So there are lots of different ways of sorting data um, and there are lots of different algorithms and some of them are better at sorting data and some of them are not so good. Um, but for this one, we're going to use a bubble sort because it's quite a nice, easy one and I can demonstrate it to you really nicely and you'll be able to hopefully understand what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab a set of cards because I'm actually going to need to use just a normal set of playing cards to do this little demo for you. Um, if you don't have cards, you can do this with words and I'll, I'll show you how to do it with words as well in a minute. Um, or you can even just write some numbers out on some paper if you don't have access to a set of playing cards. So I've just got my normal standard set of playing cards just there and that's what I'm going to be using to demonstrate um, a bubble sort. So. A bubble sort, which it seems quite appropriate with you all out there in your bubbles now, for those of you who are back in school. A bubble sort works by taking the data, which I've already put in order, and it sorts it by just looking at two of the values, just the two values that are closest to each other. I think I'll just do it with four cards to start with. There we go. So I'm just going to jumble these up so I can show you. Okay. So there is my data, it is not in the right order, and as I said to you, the max function needs it to be so that the very biggest number is here, and then it goes down in order, so it's in descending order, okay? So to do a bubble sort, and we're going to do bubble sort descending, we start by looking at these two cards, and we look at them and we decide whether it's in the right order. So if it was going to be in descending order, 
these two are not in the right order because at the moment this is lower than this card but it should be the opposite way around so if they're not in the right position then we do a swap so we swap those two over and now we have them in the right position then we move along to the next pair of cards and we do the same thing we look at the two cards and check to see if they're in the right order which they're not because again five is lower than six so they need to swap and we swap the two cards over then we move on to the next two and again we check to see if the two cards are in order and again they're not in the right order so we swap them okay and this is where bubble sort is really interesting because what happens now is it just goes back to the beginning and it does again it does it again and it checks each pair of cards is this in the right order yes it is because this one is bigger than this one so they can stay where they are go to the next two is this one bigger than this one no it's not so they need to swap and we swap the two cards over then we do the same with this one are these in the right order no it's not because this one is bigger than this one so we swap them over okay and oh no they're in the right order apologies so that was me <laughs> luckily computers are better than me at doing algorithms so that's the right order now so this one's bigger than this one so they don't have to swap now with bubble sort it has to do one more check through because it only knows that everything is sorted into the right order when it doesn't need to do any swaps anymore so it checks these two does it do they need to swap no checks these two do they need to swap no check these two do they need to swap no so now the data can stay in the order it's in because it's now completely sorted okay can see it starts from eight seven six five and as we said with the max function once it's sorted into descending order all it has to do is find the first item and in this case the first item is the number eight which is the highest number in our set of cards okay so that's how bubble sort works now i did say i was going to show you how to do this with words now we've just put out some new activities actually and there's a new one all about ascii which you might be interested in have a look at on our YouTube channel. And I'll talk about that a bit more later because this next activity, which I'm just going to show you with using some words, um, uses the ASCII value of the cards. So we're only going to be worried about the very first letter of each name. And what we're going to use is the ASCII value or the American Standard Code for Information Interchange Code. Um, and this is a number that is used to represent each of the letters. So A is going to be the lowest of the numbers because it's going to be the first of the alphabet so um, the capital a is 65 in um, ascii code and it's then converted into binary code um, so 65 would be the a 66 is b 67 is c etc okay so we're going to sort these into the right order we're going to do des descending again so we do exactly the same job so we start here is b after d in the alphabet no so it needs to swap is b after a in the alphabet yes it is so it can stay where it is is a after c in the alphabet no it's not so it needs to swap is a after f in the alphabet no it's not so it needs to swap is a after e in the alphabet no it's not so it needs to swap then we start from the beginning again is d after b in the alphabet yes it is it can stay is B after C in the alphabet? No, it's not, so it needs to swap. Is B after F in the alphabet? No, it's not, so it needs to swap. Is B after E in the alphabet? No, it's not, so it needs to swap. Is B after A in the alphabet? Yes, it is, so it stays where it is. And we go back to the beginning, and we do the same thing again. We keep swapping all the time it needs to swap. That can stay where it is. Those two can swap. Oops those two need to swap they can stay where they are they can stay where they are start from the beginning again those two can swap those two can swap those two can swap oh no that's the right way around apologies <laughs> those two can stay where they are those can stay where they are those can stay where they are and we do one more sweep through to make sure there's no more swaps no swaps no swaps no swaps no swaps no swaps Okay, so there you have it. That's how you do a bubble sort. And you can see how it works really simply just by swapping two cards at a time until all the cards are in the right order. And as I said, there are different types of sorting algorithm. You might want to look them up yourself if you are interested in finding out about some other examples. But for now, that gives you a little introduction to algorithms for sorting data.
okay. So the way this works is there are lots of different algorithm, algorithms that, big, um, that are used on big data in order to find out all sorts of different information. So big data is big business because the trends that they find out from using their algorithms tell companies about the kinds of things that people are interested in buying. So for example, a trend was found between people who like to buy trainers and like Disney, leading to vans releasing a range of Disney themed trainers. And I look at these and I think they look amazing and I am definitely part of the trend that would want to buy these trainers. So you can see how um, using big data to look for trends actually can throw some really interesting things up that perhaps you might not have even thought of previously. Don't worry though, these companies are not interested in individuals. The data is added to other data in order to identify trends. They are also not allowed to make connections between different accounts belonging to the same person uh, and they're not allowed to share any information that they find out with clients other than the general trends that they find in the data. So there's no specifics shared about you at all with these analytics companies. But some companies are not so ethically minded. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you briefly a little bit about some of the ethics behind big data and how, if it's not used appropriately, some of the things that can happen as a result of that. Cambridge Analytica hit the news in 2016 when it came to light that they used the, the data of millions of Facebook users in order to try, try to sway their vote in the 2016 US presidential election. So they tried to find trends in the data uh, and then target specific people to try and get them to vote a particular way in the US presidential election. And we're going to watch a little video just to get uh, have a little bit of a further look at this now. Who has seen an advertisement that has convinced you that your microphone is listening to your conversations? All of your interactions, your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. The real game changer was Cambridge Analytica. They'd worked for the Trump campaign and for the Brexit campaign. They started using information warfare. Cambridge Analytica claimed to have 5,000 data points on every American voter. I started tracking down all these Cambridge Analytica ex-employees. Someone else that you should be calling to the committee is Brittany Kaiser. Brittany Kaiser, once a key player inside Cambridge Analytica, casting herself as a whistleblower. The reason why Google and Facebook are the most powerful companies in the world is because last year data surpassed oil in value. Data is the most valuable asset on Earth. We targeted those whose minds we thought we could change until they saw the world the way we wanted them to. I do know that their targeting tool was considered a weapon. There is a possibility that the American public had been experimented on. This is becoming a criminal matter. When people see the extent of the surveillance, I think they're going to be shocked. And I still fear for your life yeah. with the powerful people that are involved. But I can't keep quiet just because it'll make powerful people I, I, mad. I, I, I... Data rights should be considered just fundamental rights. This is about the integrity of our democracy. These platforms which were created to connect us have now been weaponized. It's impossible to know what is what because nothing is what it seems. Okay, so if you're interested in finding out a bit more about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, then the Great Hack is on uh, Netflix and you can find out a bit more about that if you're interested in learning a little bit more. So as you can see, big data is big business and it's really important that we consider how we protect our data so that it's not used in an inappropriate way. Um, so how did they do it? So if you are interested in finding out a bit more about it, as I said, watch watch the documentary, but it, just a brief um, little um sign up a little just a 
a little bit of information about how they do it. So they used a personality test like this online. They broke the law in two ways. They told users that the data was not going was going to be used in a scientific research, um, and that's what they were given consent for. They were going to be used in scientific research, but in fact they were going to sell it onto their clients. So they broke the law in one way by doing that because they were telling you that the data was going to be used in a different way to the way they actually used it. The second law they broke was also the General Data Protection Act Regulation, or GDPR, as by logging into the quiz using Facebook, not only did you agree to share your own data, but you were also agreeing to share your friend's data too. And you can't give consent to share somebody else's data. It always has to be given by the data holder themselves. Um, there you go. This breaks GDPR as you can only agree to share, agree to share your own data, not somebody else's. Facebook also got into trouble because of this loophole um, that allowed people to provide access to other person's data and they were actually fined £500,000 uh, as a result of breaking the GDPR regulations. So when you've used an app, game or website, you might have seen a privacy statement pop up like this one. These tell you what you're about to do and what kind of data you're sharing and how it's going to be used. It's important that you think about whether these companies actually need to have this data. If you're not sure what they're going to do with it, then don't use them. So now you know what happens with the data you share publicly on social media and how apps that require you to log in with a social media account are requesting to access your data. The next part we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how you could create one of those quizzes like those personality quizzes that you sometimes see on Facebook. And we're going to learn how to make that in a program in a language, sorry, called Python. So that's what we're going to be doing next time. And I'll give you a little bit more of a, a sneaky peek of that in just a moment. So in this workshop, you've learned about collecting data using a survey. You've learned about using open and closed questions in your survey. And we've learned some simple filtering techniques using Guess Who. We also learned how to analyse the survey data and we use tallies to do that to find out the information that people had told us um, about the kind of party they wanted to have. And then we learned how to use a sorting algorithm and we sorted both numbers and we also learned how to sort uh, words using ASCII code. Um, and then we also talked briefly about uh, identifying when an app is asking to access your, access your data and also to make you sure that you think about what data you're sharing and why that company might want it. Now, as usual, if you have any questions for me from today's workshop, please pop them into the chat now. I'll pop a little uh, note in the window if you have any questions um, so that you know that we're waiting for them. So please pop your questions in now and while I'm waiting for any questions to come through from the chat I'll do a quick sneaky peek of what we're going to be doing next time so as I said we're going to be learning how to make a questionnaire um, we're going to learn how to do it in Python so it's going to be a programmed questionnaire where you're answering questions and it will tell you something about yourself so the example that we're going to be using is is going to be based around what Harry Potter Hogwarts house you would be in. You can change that, you don't have to do the same as I do. It's completely up to you. Um, so you're gonna be doing lots of different questions like what's your favorite color, what's your favorite genre of film, the kind of things that you sometimes see on Facebook, um, which then tell you something about your personality. Um, but this is gonna be, um, as I said, telling you what Harry Potter house you would be in. But don't worry, if you're not interested in that, you can change it to something else if you want to. So that's your sneaky peek for next time. So hopefully you've enjoyed Big Data Part 1 and you're going to be joining me on Friday for our second part. I can see that we've not got any questions in the chat room today, so that's fine. So I'm going to just leave you with our usual sign off to say thank you very much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed today's workshop. Um, if you've enjoyed this workshop, check out our YouTube, YouTube channel for more follow along activities. In fact, we've just released a new set of four new follow along videos and you'll find that in the set of videos called How to Raise a Tech Genius. So please do check those out. If you've got any questions or feedback for me, please email dsh at uki.org.uk. Now, we'd love to see you computing at home and we would ask you to share that on YouTube, on Facebook or on Twitter using the hashtag computing at home. Um, parents and guardians, please do share those photos and videos if you have them. We've also got a special competition running at the moment on our website, um, which I will just quickly show you a little bit about because I can actually show you on um, 
live on the website so bear me a moment i'll quickly show that to you so if you're interested in taking part in our special um competition which is all based around um it's an english competition and it's called superheroes unite and i'll quickly show you where to find that if you're interested it's in the resources section superheroes unite um, it is an opportunity for you to write some backstories for some lovely new characters that we've got at Digital Schoolhouse. So please do have a look at that. It's a creative writing competition um, and feel free to send in your, um, your competition entries. We'd love to see those. So finally, I hope you've enjoyed this workshop today. Uh, I'm Estelle. I hope you've enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you next time.